So you're thinking about buying an E85 or E86 Z4, a bit like this Z4 Coupe I've got here with me, but you want to know a bit more about them. And today's video is going to be effectively a bit of a buyer's guide on the things you should know and the things you should look out for when buying one of these cars. Okay then, so as I mentioned, there are two models basically of this generation of Z4. You've got the E85, which was the Roadster. Now that was introduced in 2003 and it was discontinued in 2008. And in 2006 came the E86, the Coupe, like I've got here. And that was made up until I think early 2009, but a few places do say late 2008. So, you know, it gives you an idea of anyway, kind of what periods we're looking at. The first thing we're gonna talk about is engines. There was a range of engines available throughout the kind of six or so years that these cars were built ranging from a four-cylinder up to various six-cylinder models. The four-cylinder model was the N46. That was a two-litre four-cylinder engine, made 148 horsepower. And to be honest, I think it's probably going to be a little bit underwhelming. I've never driven a car with that engine, but I personally think it's always going to be worth going for a six-cylinder engine in a car like this. 148 horsepower, although it's not absolutely tons of power, it's going to kind of do a job, but maybe not be the most interesting thing. So, you know, it's kind of, one of those things really that you've got to decide, but I would always recommend going for the six cylinder models. The next engine we're going to talk about is the M54. And this is probably the most popular engine because it appeared for quite a number of years in this, in this platform in various engine sizes, anywhere from a 2.2 up to a three liter. So the power rating on the M54 was anywhere from 174 horsepower up to 228 horsepower. So it's a pretty reasonable range and actually 228 horsepower if you're going for the three liter model is quite a bit in a car that weighs, you know, 1300 kilograms. So fairly decent performance. And those cars have a top speed of 155 miles an hour and a 0 to 60 in the kind of six second range. So it's pretty decent. However, there are some issues with the M54, which we will address now. So the M54 uses double Vanos and Vanos is essentially something that varies the cam timing to increase efficiency of the air kind of flowing in and out of the cylinders. So this relies on oil pressure. There are seals within the Vanos system that can degrade over time, which is pretty normal. Everyone knows that oil and seals don't necessarily mix that well after long periods of time when seals do degrade. What that'll effectively mean is your Vanos system won't work very well. It is usually pretty noticeable by poor performance or poor fuel economy. Like I said, if you took a car for a drive and it just felt like the engine was maybe a bit lumpy or you didn't really have ample performance throughout the rev range, that could be a sign that your Vanos seals are on the way out. Another thing is the valve covers on the M54. For some reason, BMW made these out of plastic and after a while they can crack. And of course, oil is then going to leak, usually into your spark plug, kind of into the divots where they sit or onto the exhaust manifold. This is usually gonna smell, obviously, because that oil is gonna burn when you're driving and also just that amount of oil sitting there, you'll probably be able to smell it anyway. So yeah, it can be fairly obvious and yeah, as well as the valve covers, you could have a, a rocker cover gasket fail. That's pretty common on most cars, to be honest. It happens quite a lot on the M54s. So yeah, you might have to change the uh, rocker cover gasket after a while. Again, that will create oil leaks kind of onto the manifold and onto the spark plugs, and it should be fairly noticeable. Not a particularly expensive part, but the valve covers are quite expensive. I was reading they could be up to £400 to replace, which is quite a lot of money. So yeah, that's kind of some of the main issues there. We've also got another very strange one. The M54 has a... A chain driven oil pump and there is a nut that holds the sprocket onto the shaft that drives the oil pump and believe it or not for engines that are run harder this is generally more of an issue for engines that are kind of tracked quite a bit as opposed to engines that are driven on road but that nut can actually work itself loose and effectively it means that the sprocket can come off the shaft and then you lose oil pressure pretty much instantly obviously that is a very bad thing to happen and it'll cause catastrophic engine damage in terms of what you can do about this, well, a lot of people apparently use Loctite on that nut and it can just help it to kind of stay on there. And yeah, I mean, it's not something you probably need to be too concerned about. I mean, let's be honest, the M54 was used across so many different BMWs for so many years. This isn't a massive, massive issue that everyone's facing, but it's just something to be aware of. And if you were kind of going into the vicinity of the oil pump gear and the, and the chain, it could be worth checking just to see and possibly taking it off, putting it back on with some Loctite. Of course, being a BMW engine, water pumps and thermostats are an issue. They eventually go. Apparently this usually happens around the 60,000 to 100,000 mile mark. A failing water pump will usually lead to things like overheating. You might have a coolant leak. Same with a thermostat, depending on which position it sticks in. If it sticks open, that's potentially not as bad because it'll effectively mean that the engine won't overheat, although it will take a long time to reach operating temperature, which still isn't good. 
However, it's better than it being closed, the way you've not got the radiator in circulation and therefore the engine is prone to overheating probably pretty quickly. So like I say, it should be pretty obvious. I mean, the main thing is obviously test drive the car, get it up to operating temperature, and that should tell you pretty quickly if you do have any issues with the cooling system. So the final issue I want to talk about on the M54 is the disavalves. Now the disavalve stands for something in German that I'm not even going to try and pronounce, but effectively what this is trying to do is optimize airflow into the cylinders by limiting how and when the air flows through the intake. Fortunately, there's a lot of plastic parts in this and over time, after it's been exposed to heat cycles, parts of those, uh, part of that valve can actually break off. And of course, with this being attached to the intake, you don't want pieces of plastic being pulled into the engine. That's not a good thing. It's usually fairly easy to tell, apparently, if you've got a broken disavow, apparently you can have pretty loud rattling from the engine bay. But again, you know, it's just something to be aware of. If you do hear loud noises from the engine, definitely worth investigating because you just don't know how serious that could be. So the next engine I'm going to be talking about is the N52. This is the engine I'm probably most qualified to speak about. It's what's in my Z4 Coupe here. I've done thousands of miles with this engine and I'm pretty confident I can say a few useful things about it. Now it was introduced in 2006. There was either a 2.5 litre version or a 3 litre version. In the coupes you could only get the 3 litre version and that's 265 horsepower. I think the 2.5 was 218. Um, but yeah, this is a fantastic engine. It would probably be my choice, but we'll get more onto that later. Although it does still have some issues. So the first issue is Vanos solenoid failure. We've talked a bit about the Vanos system. It's also on the N52 and the solenoids are what control the oil pressure essentially into that system. If the solenoid fails, then the Vanos system isn't going to work. Again, what this is going to lead to is poor performance, poor fuel economy, rough running. Again, should be pretty noticeable. I think more at lower RPMs than higher RPMs, but it's just something to be aware of and you should definitely test drive the car as always, because that will highlight issues like that. Another one is water pumps. For some reason, they use an electric water pump on these engines and they're known to fail. I mean, obviously they will, all components will fail at some point. I think it's usually around this sort of 70,000 mile mark that the water pumps tend to go. Obviously that's not always the case, but it's an expensive part if it does go. Again, if it goes, you'll be looking at probably uh, issues such as overheating, coolant leaks potentially. There's a few plastic components within those water pumps and they can degrade over time or break off and that's where you're going to get your leaks occurring. To replace, I think it's around about £400 for the part, obviously plus labour, so relatively expensive as I say. Again, thermostats could go on these engines as well. It's a fairly common part that can break and uh, that will also lead to overheating potentially or taking a long time to reach operating temperature depending on where it, where it breaks and which position it breaks. Another sort of not so much of an issue but just something to be aware of if you hear one of these engines running is the hydraulic lifters. Essentially, there was a bit of poor design work that went on. That means they don't get sufficient oil when they're running. And this is more of a thing with the engines that get higher mileage. But effectively, what happens is it creates quite a loud tapping noise or a ticking noise. It's not really something that's easy to get rid of. Um, you could be looking at a lot of money, really, to replace all those parts, to refresh them and to get it running quiet again. There are certain things you can do, such as running it at higher RPMs for a while to kind of bleed it out and refresh the oil in there. But it's not something to worry about too much and if you do hear loud ticking it more than likely is that and then there's some final things there's the usual oil leaks from the oil filter housing you've also got things like the uh, valve cover gasket that can leak you know, just the usual maintenance items it's also been known for coil packs to go on these and yeah that could cause rough running misfires things like that so it should be pretty obvious if you test drive the car So the final engine I want to talk about that was really specific to the Z4M is the S54. Perhaps one of BMW's greatest engines, definitely one of the best M engines of all time. It's a 3.2 litre naturally aspirated straight six. Think of it as a bit like a race engine for the road, essentially. It revs to 8,000 RPM, 
makes 343 horsepower and gives you some of the best induction noise you'll probably ever hear in a car. But it doesn't come without its flaws, pretty much like any BMW engine, I suppose. However, these ones are potentially a little bit more serious. When the S54 was first introduced on the E46 M3 in the early 2000s, there were some issues, particularly with the rod bearings. This is something that is talked about a lot on the internet, perhaps to the point of sheer exaggeration, to be honest. And actually the problems were rectified to some extent after 2003. So when they were used in these cars in sort of what, 2006 kind of onwards, um, you know, those issues were not as big, let's just say. However, rod bearings are still effectively a wear item on the, F, on the S54. And this is really down to the clearance between the actual bearing itself and the crankshaft journal being too tight, which just means there wasn't sufficient lubrication and then you get excess heat. And it just really damages the rod bearings as you'd expect. And that's not good at all because that is a really major component of the engine. If that goes, you are looking at major, major engine damage and it's effectively a write-off. You know, you're gonna be looking at a full rebuild or a new engine, either of which cost a lot of money. It's possible to replace these. It's definitely recommended doing if you don't really have history on them. You know, this is perhaps a little bit subjective. As I say, some people really exaggerate how much of an issue this is, but for cars that are kind of getting to that 70, 80,000 mile point, it could be worth doing, but it really just depends on how the car's been looked after. If you've had regular oil changes, if it's been brought up to temperature, this isn't too much of an issue. But yeah, as I say, it's really up to the owner to decide. To replace, you're looking at over a thousand pounds, possibly north of 1500, depending on where you go and sort of whether you change the rod bolts as well, which you definitely should. But I suppose kind of which products you choose is more what I mean. So yeah, something to think about. You do have Vanos issues on the S54. It's an older engine, so the Vanos system is a little bit more complex. There's a few more parts going on in there and you know, various things can break but it's just, you know, similar sort of issues to the N50, uh, N52 and M54. And in typical BMW fashion, the last thing I want to mention on the S54 is water pump failure. Again, these will like to go at some point, pretty common issue, but not too expensive to replace. So it's just worth, uh, worth keeping track of. And if you've got coolant leaks, it could well be that. So that pretty much summarizes the engines. I think that's really one of the main things to be aware of on these cars, just because there was such a variety of engines used and they've all got their own little quirks. Now, my personal choice would be the N52. I think this really gives you the balance of sort of all the different things that you could want. You've got a little bit more performance than the M54 with it revving out higher and a slightly higher power figure, but you've not sort of got those major issues that could occur with the S54. It's also a later engine, so it's a bit more fuel efficient as well. So for daily use, this would personally be my choice. But if you want something that's going to be really quite special, more of a weekend toy, then that's perhaps where the S54 will come in. Now, I did a community post not too long ago, and one of the things that people were interested in knowing about is N52 tunability. So I want to just talk for a couple of minutes about this, seeing as I've had my N52 for a while. There are a few things you can do. What you've got to think is this is not really a really high performance engine. There's not going to be a million things that you can do to it to extract masses of power. It's also naturally aspirated. It's kind of pushed really quite far already in what it can do. Compression ratio is 11 to one, which is reasonably high, but obviously not being turbocharged, you don't really have as many things to mess about with. But there are still a few options. You can start with things like an air intake. This isn't really gonna add masses of power. If you're lucky, you could be looking at five horsepower, but it's gonna give you a bit more induction noise, which is always nice. In terms of exhaust and exhaust manifolds, this is where some great gains can be had, particularly on the exhaust manifold. You could get 20, 25 horsepower if you put a performance manifold on this, add in a decent sort of rest of the system and the back box and everything, you could possibly get another five horsepower. So that's pretty reasonable gains right there. And also this is gonna shift kind of where the engine delivers peak torque and peak power as well and give you a, a greater uh, power and torque curve. It could also be worth doing an ECU tune. This is not gonna extract loads of power, but what it can do is just help those other mods work more effectively. But if you're lucky, you might get five horsepower, maybe 10 horsepower from an ECU tune. So another perhaps a bit more lesser known mod that you can do to the N52 is the Modified Intake Lift Valvetronic Supports or MILVs. And there's one company that does this, I think it's called Bimmer MILVs. And I was checking out their website and they've got a bit more in information on that actually. And effectively what this does, is it adds one millimeter of valve lift and two to three degrees of uh, duration on the cam. 
So what is this system going to do? Well, it's going to improve your efficiency of airflow, as is the way with a lot of these mods on this car. It's kind of about improving airflow into the engine. That's really how you extract the most power from a naturally aspirated engine. It is going to bump power up perhaps by about 10 horsepower, but what it's giving you is greater power and torque kind of across the curve, which is obviously something that you're going to feel out on the road. Apparently it's quite easy to do as well, but I haven't kind of done it myself, so I can't speak too much on that. Okay, so that's the engines done. Obviously that is quite an extensive list, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of go through them all in some reasonable detail because I think all those engines are popular in their own regards. But now let's talk about some other issues. If you're buying an E85, the soft top version, you do need to be aware the soft tops will eventually kind of wear out to the point where they might leak, or they might even rip, or you might have issues with the motors and other parts of the sort of system that allows it to fall down. So always worth checking that out to check it works right. But yeah, after a while, parts are going to need to be replaced. The other thing with these cars is suspension. It's a relatively firm ride, as you'd probably expect for kind of like a sports car. And yeah, on British roads, these suspension systems do take a fair bit of abuse. You know, it's been put through its paces with the undulations and potholes and things like that. So bushings are gonna wear out, uh, shock absorbers are gonna wear out. And also it has been relatively common for springs to break or crack on these. That is all relatively noticeable things if you're out test driving the car or driving the car in general you'll hear knocks if you're going through bumps or it might feel slightly unsettled or it might be a bit bouncy if the shock absorbers are gone but yeah it's generally stuff that you probably need to get under the car to see properly so if you can do that it's definitely worth doing the next thing is run flat tires now all these cars came with run flat tires i believe at least from factory now they're terrible don't buy run flats don't get run flats get rid of them and put proper tires on because the car rides better they seem to provide more grip it's quieter on the road they're just so much better and they're the same price if not cheaper now i've got michelin pilot sport fours all around these are fantastic tires i've picked them up basically for as long as i've been using them which is several years and they seem to work great all year round for me so that would be my recommendation but in general switching away from run flats is highly recommended the other thing I want to talk about is transmissions. There was a wide range of transmissions available, anything from torque converter autos to SMGs to various manual gearboxes. The SMG, well, that is a sequential manual gearbox. It's kind of like an early, early automatic flappy paddle type gearbox, and it is effectively an automated manual. So computers and hydraulic pumps actuate the clutch mechanism and the shift mechanism, but it's in essence a manual gearbox. It's a bit clunky, it's got quite a bit of character, it's kind of a similar sort of thing that was used in the E46 M3 in those SMG cars and the E60 M5. However, it's, it's not really the best transmission and yeah, I think the, the normal auto is probably a better transmission to live with. It's also cheaper to repair because you don't have things like those hydraulic actuators and, and the pumps and things which can go out and they are quite expensive to replace. Ultimately though, my recommendation would be just get a manual gearbox if you can. These are driver's cars, they're designed to be driven properly. And my choice would always be the manual. I've got the six speed ZF in mine and that works brilliantly. It does take a little bit of heat to kind of get it up to temperature and you know, just to get it feeling right really. But overall it's a brilliant gearbox. So that would be my recommendation. Interestingly as well, I don't know if this is specific just to this gearbox, perhaps, maybe not. This is just an issue with my car, but um, the lay shaft, or one of the sort of intermediate shafts in the gearbox, is quite loud when it's just in neutral and your foot is off the clutch. So when the engine is basically rotating that shaft, you can just hear a little bit of sort of gearbox noise. Now, this seems totally fine to me. And to be honest, I was doing some research on this car and one of the, I think maybe the second owner actually got the gearbox and clutch replaced under warranty uh, for the same reason. And the new gearbox seems to do exactly the same thing. So if you have, a three liter SI coupe. Let me know if when the car's in neutral and your foot's off the clutch, if you can hear that too. But yeah, it's just something I've noticed and it, it doesn't seem to do any, it doesn't cause any issues. And clearly the gearbox is fine. This thing's got a ton of miles on it since that gearbox was done. So 
yeah, if you do hear that sort of lay shaft noise when it's in neutral, uh, probably don't be alarmed by it. It's been absolutely fine for me. Another thing is rust. These cars, you know, if you're getting 2003 models, you're getting 18, 19 years old now, and you are potentially going to be facing some rust issues. Often things like the wings will go, you might get bubbling just around the edges where stone chips have chipped bits of paint off and eventually it starts to rust. Same with some of the other body panels, maybe at the bottom of the doors and things like that. Generally though, the later cars should still be okay at this point in late 2021, going into 2022, but it's just something to be aware of. You know, you could start to have rust issues. The final thing I wanted to mention is electrical issues. Now, these cars seem to be pretty good electrically. Um, I did have a bit of a weird issue with my radio and infotainment system a while ago where I just couldn't control it and the radio just didn't work for about a week and then it started working again. I pulled fuses, didn't seem to change anything. So I'm not really sure what was going on there. But yeah, generally all your things should work all your dials should work, all your windows should work. If you've got any issues, then it's probably worth looking into a bit deeper. Okay, so the final bit then, maintenance costs and prices. Now maintenance for me, um, I bought this car in pretty good condition. It had been well maintained. I was hoping therefore that I wouldn't really have to spend too much on maintenance and so far I haven't. I recently replaced the front tires to put Michelin Pilot Sport 4s on. I've got PS4s on the back and that was about 300 quid. I've also had to top up the oil uh, put one litre of oil in, I think that was about £15. So yeah, it's cost me, what, £315 in six or seven months. So it's not too bad. That's obviously not the case for everyone. I expect there will be some maintenance items at some point in the future. And you probably want to be looking at budgeting maybe about £100 a month. Uh, so about $130 a month if you're in the US to run one of these and to maintain it. If you're looking at a Z4M, probably looking at more like £150 to £200 a month. Um, you know, those cars generally are a bit more expensive to maintain, often just down to the S54, but ultimately this platform shares a lot with the E46 3 Series, and the prices on those for parts aren't too expensive. So yeah, not a particularly expensive car to maintain. I personally would recommend doing an oil change at least annually, ideally every five or 6,000 miles if that comes sooner, because these cars aren't necessarily going to be driven all that often, and when they are driven, they tend to be driven a bit harder than your everyday car would be, so that oil is going to take a bit more abuse, and particularly for engines like the S54, which are quite sensitive to high-quality oil, you just want to keep on top of it. And at the end of the day, oil changes are very important, and for what they cost, they're always worth doing. So yeah, that would be my recommendation. Okay, so the final, final thing I wanted to cover is prices. Just to give you a rough guide of what you can expect to pay at this point, it's currently December 2021. Who knows what will happen with prices in 2022? But right now for an E85 Z4 Roadster, you could be looking at paying anywhere from about 2,500 pounds for like the high mileage, probably not great condition cars. If you want to get into something decent, then probably expect to pay 6,000 pounds and up. Obviously for the best ones, you could be looking at paying considerably more than that. This Z4 Coupe, the three liter SI model, uh, you can get in these probably about as cheap as six or seven thousand pounds for the high mileage ones. I was looking on Auto Trader, and I think there were some that had about 180,000 miles, which gives you an idea of reliability of these things, by the way. But also, they were going for about six or seven thousand pounds. If you want something decent and something nice, then prices probably start at about ten thousand pounds. And for the nicest ones, expect to pay anywhere between fifteen and twenty thousand pounds. The Z4M, they're going to fetch a decent premium. For a nice one, you're looking at £25,000. You know, it's kind of similar money to an E46 M3, really. Uh, I think even the cheapest ones are probably into the high teens, at least in the sort of £15,000 range. So it gives you an idea anyway. As I say, prices can change. Who knows what will happen? So anyway, that sums up this buyer's guide video. It's not an exhaustive list. Um, it's always important to do your own research. I'm not qualified to speak on every single bit of these cars, and I'm not an encyclopedia on them either. So always do your own research if you are buying one. But anyway, I hope this was useful to a lot of you and um, I hope it inspires you to go and buy one as well because it is a fantastic car. And if you want to see more on this car, you can check out the playlist up here. Also subscribe if you're new to the channel and drop the video a like if you've enjoyed it. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.